La Not Witcher Lee, look at her. Good. Look at her, she's chasing her tail. No, there's a there's a bug on her, there's a bee on her tail. There's a bug crawling around on her tail, it's making her oh, crazy. Okay, so that's why she's going off. I think she got it though. Oh, well, she, yeah, it's yeah, a very it, it, fluffy, it was cute, but killing machine anyway. <laughs> All right, welcome to Two Dudes Watching a Cat. <laughs> The a podcast? big cat. Yeah, but at least it's a big cat. So, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. See, I think it's a fucking... Yeah, there's a bug. Oh, that is so funny. You, you, there's a, my cat has a um, bug on her fluffy tail and she's just going around like a dog chasing her own tail. It's pretty funny. She's a kitten still, even though she's the size of a grown cat. Well, past the size of a grown cat now. Bigger than even, any cat I've owned. Yeah, I and think. she's not even five months old. That's going to yeah. be fun. It's the cat version of Fletch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, this week's episode, we're going to get into a study... Uh, on that, fat people. That you had found. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. It's, no, it's no, no. The... Okay, but wait, wait, wait. Let's backtrack a bit. Remember when the whole COVID-19 uh, started and I said that obesity, it was going to be to, uh, to uh, hit the obesity crowd really hard because yeah. it was obvious in the system and everything. And we had actually comments. Yeah. And the dude saying, how dare, fine, how can you be rash All like this? All these other comorbidities. Yeah, blah, and, blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 da. and at the time I was like, and then so I was like, really, first of all, I was not fat shaming. I was talking about something that seemed fairly obvious to me. Yeah. All right, so fast forward two, three months. Guess what? Here we are. Obesity <laughs> is, well, it was the biggest comorbidity after age. Yep. So I even tagged the guy on it. I was like, so do you still think I was being rash <laughs> on my, on saying, uh, and no answer yeah so this is where i this is where um social media annoys me the most where you don't like what i say you get to comment yep. right you're wrong i was right so you don't have the balls to come and say whoops oops right yeah. and when and then i tag you on it and i say so what do you think now i wasn't insulting the yeah. guy I just say what do you think now and he's not answering this is where I'm like, well, this is where you get uh, and, blot. And that's on that, the big that problem, shit. too. We've talked about the way social media is designed is that yeah. you're, we're not meant to uh, problem solve together. We're not meant to reach compromises anymore. Yeah. Like you're not, that's not what anything is there for. So, so yeah. going to that conversation was what? To tell you that you were wrong. Yeah, right. So but everything then, is a vector of attack. Yeah. That's all this is. People look for something to attack. And when they're wrong, they just go somewhere else. Yeah. Like when we made the joke about uh, strong men, it's like CrossFit for, uh, for, for men. men. Yeah. All the women I got upset once I explained, no one answered. Yeah. None of them answered like, oh, okay, I didn't oh, get shit, the joke. Sorry. Yeah. Not even sorry. I didn't get the joke. I'd yeah. be like, all right. This is what upsets me about yeah. social media the most. Is, so, that, is that shit. Like with this too, this, this is, we're going to go through a study today that's on uh, basically obesity and its and, effects on cognition. Right. And why? Because, sorry, we have to stop with that idea that, um, you know, like round is a shape. Mm -hmm. Like that walk thing about obesity not being a problem is the, there's actually well, a, there's an article that came out two days ago about a fat professor. Not the professor wasn't fat. She was a professor of, on obesity and yeah. stuff like that explaining that the COVID-19 was going to uh, increase fat phobia mm -hmm. and explaining why that was a problem. And I was like, this is what's wrong with the world right now. Well, and the issue is, is like, I, I, as a person, you shouldn't have to fucking make these uh, qualifiers when you talk. You should be able to just say that like unhealthy is whatever, a problem. Whatever the criteria are. Is a problem. Is a problem. Unhealthy is unhealthy. So you can do yes. not tell me that unhealthy is healthy because you're fucking lying. So if, yes. if being obese, can you have some measure of health while being somewhat overweight more than others of the same body fat percent? Of course, of course you can be healthier than another person who is just the same as you or less obese than you or right. less body but, fat. But the same thing that happens when, so people shit on BMI as a measurement, right? Body mass. For a good reason. No. For yes. a good reason, except for what BMI is not made to tell you that you're obese. That's the issue. You, yes. you were never meant to, as an individual, see your BMI and do anything with that data. It's not useful for you. BMI is made for measuring the fucking body mass of a society. It's of a population. Yes. And when you zoom out to the population level, then you can actually get an understanding of the trends that are associated with right. body mass. And for example, if and you increase your, your BMI by 20 points over two years... Your mortality it, rate increases dramatically. 
Even if it's muscle, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. And so when you see, it's the thing I hate the most in the fitness world is you'll see someone go do a body scan. Yeah. And then they come off some high road shit because they just don't understand what the measurements for and say, according to this body mass, I'm obese. See, this thing's bullshit. And it's like, well, no, that's not what it's for. Yeah. Like, like yeah. If but okay. also just remember <laughs> that most people. With that body mass index, yes. If I'm covering for just statistics, are going to have problems in that area, and and as it's going right. to escalate the, on the thing an is, the BMI way. doesn't work in the fitness industry. No, because a lot of us carry way more However, muscle than the usual person. But there is a point where carrying lots of muscle, even like, still, it's very is problematic for yeah. your mortality. Yeah, and uh, and so, but I think. The problem is you can't talk matters. about these things. Right. So, so this yeah. is what we actually felt when Julie and I were going through this. We felt like we almost had to read this, direct, like a lot of it we, we do. will from the study. Because otherwise we're going to get, they're going to shoot the messenger yeah. on that one. But we need to be able to talk about obesity as a problem. Yeah. So so now that they, they're turning it into some kind of weird, like uh, I can be obese and beautiful and stuff like that. It's like... Who's talking about physical beauty? This is not what we're talking yeah. about. And this is where I get, I get upset uh, with that because they are choosing the argument that suits them the best to defend something that... So they, they're trying to, to direct the conversation toward aesthetics mm -hmm. where we're talking about health and we know the two it's are two not things. related. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, so it's, it's an absurd conversation, but it also harms people. Look at the US. Obesity is only increasing for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Like, when does it become obvious there's a problem there? And I know people in Europe won't necessarily relate to that because they, you have one obese person per town. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I there's mean, I, very, very few. It's, yeah. I, there was a guy in my neighborhood yesterday, of course, right. pulled up in a car. But 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 I noticed I, I was like I was like that I don't want to say this wrong way but I was like that is that's a fat person and yeah. that my first thought was was like it's like he's I from the seen, like someone yeah. I see when yeah. I was fat you home. haven't seen them in a, and, yeah. and 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 it's just kind of the way that it is and we've talked about it before but um, yeah it's much less common here as for yeah. the population and I'm sure you can look up the statistics we'll all back yes. all of that up too um, but it really is I don't know it's interesting because this is a conversation about health. It's a conversation about obesity as a health risk and not about you as a person, much like heart disease as a health risk. If yes. Julian was at high risk for heart failure, me wanting Julian to do something to get his heart better is because I care about Julian. We it's not, not because yeah. I think you're ugly or stupid. Yes, exactly. Like, where well, well, those two is? And, and they yeah. attach fat shaming to that yes, exactly. as the thing, as a way to... Uh, attack the people who are trying to actually improve that's what the guys on youtube were yeah. doing they were saying oh you fat shaming no no i'm not accusing you of anything that's exactly what you're doing yeah. we will not not have this conversation just because we no. can't call fat people fat anymore yeah. i'm sorry like uh this, i feel like this is the ver this is this is the fat version of saying like i have i have black friends or i have yeah, gay friends yeah it's like right. but i'll tell you what i used to be quite well, overweight for a lot of my right life. so you can talk about from it. basically age 20 i can talk about it when i was 250 i was yeah. getting fat yeah and and i know what a lot of that stuff feels like and i know what it's like that kind of slippery slope where your kind yep. of whole life all of it kind of just takes like this shit, weird by the way. thing, yeah. you know? And you don't know that it's because you're fat. You just kind of are this way. And this is me speaking from just my experience. But um, but I'm going to use those terms because that's the terms that I relate to. And I'm not. we're not going to not have this conversation. We're not going to not have it. It's part of our job to explain where we think is healthy and unhealthy. Yeah. This is a fitness industry, coaching, all that stuff. Obesity is a problem. Like the fact that I have to justify yeah. that obesity is a problem shows you there's a problem like we're not winning this by the way yeah. the world is not getting any leaner that's for sure no. it's getting fatter by but us refusing to talk about it from some weird walk stuff is it's a disservice it's to kind, everybody it, it's counterproductive because yeah. a war on obesity which is i hate the term but a war on obesity is not a war on obese people much like yes. a war on drugs is not a war on drugs it's a war on poor people yes. essentially and so and, and so the inverse here is yeah. that we're attacking the actual thing. Yes. So we're taking on obesity and we're not trying to direct it at the humans or the persons right. or yeah. their own flaws. But this study is very interesting. Well, yeah, because, okay, so we're going to go at the fact that people say obesity, like there was actually 
some start in the US, so Europeans will not understand this, but we, we started to read where actually some doctors were starting to show that being overweight was actually uh, unhealthy thing because you had more energy and more this and more that and we're like this is the most insane thing i've ever read because yeah. i because you can cherry pick any piece of data right. that's going it's, to say it's exactly someone what who's do. living yep. in a caloric surplus that might have more energy right. than someone who's living in a you know basically yeah, 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 a deficit stuff. and all the shit and you could piece just that yeah, yeah more energy see it makes sense fuck so uh, and then by the way we've been doing a lot of this as well which is like there's a mainstream a version of an argument yeah. and then we we show the other part of it because usually the mainstream becomes so maybe it's because of the world we live in today becomes so dogmatic into one view that you're never allowed to criticize or show a different side of the coin or whatever so me at, at this stage like on the COVID-19 we're showing uh, yeah, okay. videos to say that it's a the lockdown was a bad idea it's being proven yeah. it actually led to more people getting COVID-19 yeah. than people who are not locked down. I mean, it, you know, like we have to be able to show two sides of an equation. Mm -hmm. On obesity, at least in the US, you are not allowed to talk about it. No. In, and, in negative terms. And and I think, so we're going to let the study do the talk. Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, let's start with that. Yeah. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read it for the sake of uh, Julian's French accent. Because <laughs> exactly. there's a lot of stuff in here. <coughs> Excuse me, and Julian will jump in and correct me and make sure let me know if I'm missing anything. No, then, like the interesting parts. Uh, yeah. So, so I can uh, I need to translate some of the stuff too. Yeah. So, cover the abstract first. Yeah. Obesity is a major problem in modern societies. It has been related to abnormal functional organization of brain networks, believed to process homeostatic internal and or salience external information. This study used resting state. Right. So salience, what they're talking about is a salience network is a processing of information. So just real yeah. fast. The three main brain networks is the one that is at rest, which is a default mode network. They're going to talk about it a lot. Then within the task positive network, so not at rest through action, you have two main ones. One is the salience network, which allows you to process information, uh, like find patterns. And then the executive network, which is acting on that information and on those patterns. Yeah. So that's what they mean by salience. <clears throat> I should read the, I'm going to give you the title before we get yeah, too right. far. It's uh, Alterations of the Salience Network in Obesity, a resting state fMRI study. So you can find that out there in the world. Or even on the uh, library. The oh, yes, library. on the Strongfield on Library yeah. also. And also when, when we say, um, where do I see this? When it uses terms uh, resting state network is that primarily the it's a default, default mode, mode network, network okay. yeah but um the salience network can work in a resting state uh, it depends Th this is the problem with that it depends when they mean resting state because they can ask you questions while you're not in motion like you have to read the studies because like the, the problem with all of this and that's usually with neuroscience is uh they phrase things sometimes the way they want i've seen the salience network being described by the executive network yeah because there's because there's multiple and technically components. you could yes and, and because by executive they may they may uh, they met task positive yeah but it's not part of the executive network in the sense of there is a sales network yeah. and the executive action network so there are some characterizations yeah. that they don't they don't go one step further in categorizing things down they, the they're categorizing for that study but that does not fit the categorization of another study yeah so sometimes you're going to get lost between the two so yeah, yeah. So what it they did right. here is uh, use the study used resting state functional MRI analysis to delineate possible functional changes in brain networks related to obesity. Exactly. Uh, 18 healthy adult participants with obesity compared with a group of 16 lean uh, performing resting so, state tasks. By the way, very small group. Yep, very small. That's actually probably the primary limitation yep. of it. Um, where are we at here? Compared with a group of 16 lean uh Performed resting state tasks with the data being evaluated by independent component analysis. Right. So, resting uh, resting state tasks. That means, technically, uh, if you remember when I said default mode network at rest, in that case, um, it doesn't work quite that like that because what they mean is they're going to give you a task so in a task positive network. They're going to give you something to think about, but not. Uh, action based. Yeah, that's what they mean by resting state. Okay, there is no physical exertion into that task. It's not walking through a maze. Exactly. Might be drawn through right. a maze. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, uh, where are we at? 
See, every time Julian inter- interrupts, so you know, I do that all the time. You should be using it. Too, That's right? the nature of it. Um, they also completed a neuropsychological assessment. Yeah. Results showed that functional connectivity strength in the putamen nucleus in the salient network was increased in the obese group. We speculate that this abnormal activation may contribute to overeating through an imbalance between auton- autonomic processing and reward processing yeah. of food stimuli. Right. So first we have to explain what the putamen nucleus Let me make is. The, I want to make the one last statement yeah. for it. There's a correlation was also observed in obesity between activation of the putamen nucleus in the salience network and mental slowness, which is consistent with the notion that the basal ganglia circuit, circuits modulate rapid processing of information. Yeah, right. So that's the conclusion for one. Um, so the putamen nucleus uh, is part of the sinus network. It's it, uh, the putamen nucleus. He thing is uh, just Google it. It, um, it relates to uh, motor control. It's a motor skill. Con- uh, uh, motor. Sk- so it's a nucleus. That means a part of the brain that is directly involved in motor skill, like the motor uh, control part yeah. of the brain. And the cellless network does that big, uh, f- through different stuff, but that's basically what's going to also allow you to allow you to go toward action. Yeah. And so over uh, eating in that sense leads to a over, I guess, excitation, you would call it, whatever they call it. Yeah. And that's the thing they go here too, is that basically the, the imaging highlights differences in processing the way food stimulus is processed between right. obese participants and lean people. Um, and the obese individuals showed increased activation in response to visual food stimulus in the regions that are associated with the reward system and to the network formed by the insula and anterior cingulate cortex. Okay, so. Which is the salience network. Right. So let's stop right there for a second because that's very important. So, what they're saying is that, um, so first of all, obesity has a link with mental slowness. Mm hmm. So that's, that's been shown through the, those MRIs. And second of all, that obesity was linked to the visual, uh, the visual presentation of food activating the motor, it's not the motor cortex, but the motor control part of you. So that would explain like obese people suddenly freaking out going like, I need to get food. Because yeah. it seems that obesity is like, it's, it's a dysregulation to a system that we have that at some point literally is a call for action to physically go get food. Is that the call to action to physically go get food or is it a symptom of living in a caloric surplus? With right, excess? okay, so that's, that becomes a and very interesting in question. There, but they yeah. both have the same cause and the right. same result. So, so is that because you're in a calorie, or is it both? So you're in a calorie uh, surplus, therefore you need to move more. Yeah. And on top of it, it seems to play with uh, visual stimulus or whatever that, well, that leads to wanting to move more and we tie in because this isn't quite covered here anyways but we've talked about with things like sympathetic fixes and food and right, but let's stop for a second there because yeah. it's, it's a very interesting rabbit hole so two things on that that would explain to you why in the fitness industry for example like you know the wanting to eat more carbs like um if you look in the last five years ten years in the fitness industry the amount of calorie that one needs has only gone up yeah which is crazy, right? Mm-hmm. The humanity has now changed the last five years. and By weight, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right. Um, <clears throat> but the calorie they tell you need to eat only goes up, yeah. especially the amount of protein or whatever. So imagine <coughs> if a constant calorie surplus would activate the putamen nucleus, like over, uh, yeah. whatever they call it, uh, over or whatever mm-hmm. they call it, of the putamen nucleus, basically, leading you to wanting to move more. If you were inclined to think that more is better and you want to train more, what would be the easiest way to finally get your ass when you're tired and you want to train another time or stuff like that, like a crossfitter who needs to train three times a day? Just carb up. Or overeat. Overeat. Yeah. Overeat would ex- start to get you into... So there was an entire yeah. uh, int- part interesting compared to that. What I also want to draw is the... the let's oppose it like obesity and then the fasting idea. Yes, that's a really good... Fasting leads to better mental cognition. We've seen that. Mentally, you like this for many reasons. Anecdotally and on many studies. And No, we know that because they're going to go into this. We see that with blood flow in the prefrontal prefrontal, uh, cortex. So we know from fasting, like you get more energy, you're sharper mentally and everything, which is from that study, which is what I like reading about it, is the opposite of obesity. Mm -hmm. So it seems like overeating and fasting are opposite. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Right, but that tells you something about body fat percentage. Certainly. But the idea then was that the problem with fasting is what always is when you train, you zonked. Yeah. 
because the body is like, I don't have necessarily the energy to do this. So you start to enter into that mode of, do I produce energy? Sympathetic, do I conserve energy? Parasympathetic. Yeah. So you can tell there's a play parasympathetic, sympathetic in fasting that you also see in, in uh, obesity, just at opposite part of the, 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 the spectrum. Yeah. So you would have uh, fasting that increases mental cognition but decreases your capacity to produce energy, over, not in one session, but over okay. time. And on the other side would be the over. Over time, you can move more, but mental cognition decreases. Mm -hmm. So that tells you there's always a happy medium. It's an arch, yes, basically. Of course. Which that, that's why I found also that part very interesting. Yeah. Well, the thing that I thought was really interesting is the simply the reward, <laughs> like the the, yes. re, the reward yes. thing starts to become a a slippery slope. Yeah. And and we'll get into that as we go. But the um, where was that fucking? I'll, I'll move on to the next thing yeah. here because that comes up later, anyways. There is also evidence in altered functional network dynamics in response to food cues on in individuals with obesity. Right. Uh, so one study found while viewing food cues, obese participants following a weight loss program had abnormal activity in the default mode network in comparison to lean participants. Two things on this. What they're referring that to altering um, the networks, if you guys remember in one of the podcasts, I talked about the ventral attention network, mm -hmm. which is a network that is in charge of you of switching from network to the next, yeah. right? And I explained the importance of that. That's what they're referring yeah. to. In that case, second of it, they're going into the default mode network. It, this is very, very important. I have another study that, it, that we put on the library that was showing that addiction was shown to be an imbalance in a default mode network. Default mode network means there's certain parts of the brain and stuff like that. And it's uh, one is toward the frontal part of the prefrontal context, the other one was the dorsal part. And the imbalance between the two, but I can't remember, was it the. I can't remember which part was being overstimulated versus the other, but that was directly linked to addiction. Yeah. So this hints as obesity as an addiction. Yeah. At the same the same functioning idea, which polluted reward system, habituation, uh, default mode physic, network, like, being, like, like yeah. actual chemistry starting to create, create weird body signals and everything, you know, visual cues leading to weird stuff. All of these symptoms that we it's talk addiction. about as well, we haven't touched at all on how then anxiety itself is going to have to introduce itself amidst this to start like trying to modify yes. behavior because anxiety has a function. Yep. And so a lot of things stack on top of this that really do create obesity and addiction. As someone who's familiar with both such things, I would say they are absolutely very, very, very much related. Maybe peeps, there are plenty of people who are obese that don't have very similar um, symptoms to people of actual addiction. Really? Tell them to stop counting. I, well, I, I just, I'm going to say maybe there's some. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but, but, I, but I can say that, that as far as my experience, people that I know that have spoke to, that's almost everyone. Would Tell me say that. that the biggest uh, loser, that this did not look like putting people through uh, a, a addiction clinic. A rehab. Yeah. A rehab clinic for yeah. six weeks. Lock them up, Where, tell them about Jesus. And, and then people, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And people start crying in the middle of it and mm -hmm. they sneak stuff yeah. uh, in the back door and... Yeah. I'm sorry, but this is, you know. Yeah. Let's see here. This one we've got. This is the fasting one. Yeah. Uh, found difference in the two resting state networks uh, when compared with lean participants in an overnight fasting condition. So 10 hours. Oh, yes. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the default mode network and the temporal lobe network. Uh, in the default mode network, obese subjects showed increased functional connectivity in the posterior cingulate cortex. Decreased strength in the right anterior cingular region. Okay, so right anterior insula, remember? That's the selector. Right, so right. the right anterior insula is a knob for everything. Yeah. It's the knob of the active eye. You know, like, I remember what I said about the podcast, authority over yourself? Yeah. Right, right anterior insula. So this is the hub of the silence network and also to the executive network. Uh, so the, the seat of the active eye, so the seat of authority over yourself, it's um, pain cognition, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, blood pressure while you train, enfin, while you're in movement. Uh, like the right anterior insula is, the, at, you, hear, you guys hear me talk about all the time. It's the seat of, of cognition, one of the seat of the sense of self, uh, sight of the sense of self. Like the right anterior insula is so important. And this was shown that it was negatively being impacted uh, yeah. in those conditions. Yeah. That's a big one. 
That's a really big one. And differences in brain activity and obesity may also be related to differences in cognitive performance, and several lines of evidence suggest that obesity is associated with lower cognitive function. Um, there's lots here where it basically states a uh, relationship between high BMI, poor results in memory and learning, uh, speed, cognitive, mental processing. There's lists and lists of studies pointing this right. out. Right, so one second. We are not saying fat people are stupid because that's what nope. people are going to read. No, because if you remember from the last podcast, I was explaining that IQ is can be two kinds of intelligence, two kinds of network. It can be into the executive network, which is taking action, or it can be into the default mode network. Both, both that are specialized into a network end up with high IQ. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, by definition, obesity will lead you to specialize more toward the default mode network, and therefore, in a weird way, will increase your IQ in that type of intelligence. Yeah. So, what it means also, in a way, in that sense, is like to me also shows that obesity will be uh, will change almost the will change the intelligence of a person. Yeah. Therefore. Not personality necessarily, but it will change the, the mental makeup of a person. Well, it's, I mean, it's like everything. It's a specialization. Anything that's obviously. out there, like, like do too much of one thing that's probably yeah. not that good for you. And it's going to change you. Right. But and so, there's going but, to be mental Right. But so maybe at first people will be like, well, I feel better when I'm there. I'm like, yeah, you are more specialized into a specific part of the default network. So I'm wondering if there's not an, an attraction to that at first. Because anytime mm -hmm. you specialize things get easier into a very narrow field. Yeah. So that would explain to you, for example, like that in order to do certain tasks, maybe like, you know, you see that with uh, coding or whatever, like would uh, a surplus of calorie help you towards specific mental jobs mm -hmm. at the expense of the overall and, and your health and everything. But it's very possible that a calorie surplus would help you get smarter at specific mental tasks. Mm -hmm. But not overall That's, and not right. over the long term. Right. And then we're going back to the Voltron effect now. Mm -hmm. The problem is, and this is what I want people to understand from our podcast and everything, is like, for example, we have to stop looking at training session as one session. Yeah. Everybody's decomposing on what I do today. Don't get me wrong. You need to look at today like it's the only day ever you're going to train in your life so that you can put all energy into it. But you also need to be able to see that one session doesn't do anything. Yeah. You will not get stronger at one session. Not it at takes all. years. So technically, you'll be weaker afterwards. Yes. I mean, yeah, 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 well, yeah, and so on. Shit. <laughs> um, so this is where the Voltron effect comes. It's like people have to stop narrowing their perspective. Yeah. Because like people, you can zoom all the way into that and say, and that's we'll what people do. Makes right. And so thing. this is where the the when people go into energy mm -hmm. uh, systems or whatever, they go 82 versus 83 percent, and they all arguing about whether they should do 82 or 83 percent for the session. Whereas, what truly matters is in the next year, how many quality workouts will you have? Yeah. The West uh, West Side, Louis mm -hmm. Simmons West Side Gym is not. Uh, one of the strongest gym in the world because of the programming. It's because you have maniacs that will sacrifice their family to beat the other to beat the other guy's PR by 10 pounds. Yeah. That's why it's one of the strongest gym. Yeah. Because over time, that kind of attitude and, and culture of the gym leads to greatness. Yeah. But it's over time. There is no one if you train at Westside one session, you have accomplished accomplished Shit! Yeah. You beat yourself to to. It's also why reading. Submission. It's also why reading a reading one of Louis's books isn't going to. You're not going to go in and just smart. be able to apply it either. The whole thing. Reading one paragraph doesn't make you smart. Yeah. And so it's very important because I, I believe people have the wrong ideas when it comes to, to things like this. And um, the Voltron effect is the most important thing. You have to understand that things are. The the brain does not process this individual uh, stimulus. It processes events. And over time, yeah. that time changes. But so as a coach, for example, you want to look at training in one session to make sure they put their best foot forward and most energy. But training has to be looked as, a, as an entity and over time. So for example, for a coach, if you want to look at a program, it's over one year, yeah. at least six months. A two-week stuff doesn't mean shit. Yeah. You have to do any program. We know you have to do it for six months to know if it works or not. Yeah. And as an overall, if it works means... Are you healthier? Are you stronger? But not on one lift, on all lifts. Like you're stronger on one lift, but your joints are killing you. That's not good. Yeah. Right. So that's what, when you read those, that's what you have to look at. It means that 
most likely a calorie surplus would allow you to be better at a specific thing. Yeah. Right. But as an overall and over time, what happens? It's, just an un, it's always going to be an unsustainable rise. Exactly. Right? And yeah. That's what matters. Yeah. Is it sustainable? Yeah. Right. So just because you can find me a data that will show, I'm sure, if we were to look that calorie surplus would lead to you doing better at a specific task, does not mean caloric surplus is a good idea. And to go all the way to the Voltron effect thing, the, the other thing that people always miss with this is that they're looking at this as a person who's what? Living in a caloric surplus forever. And they're comparing with lean people as though they're living in a caloric deficit forever. It's not how your body's designed. Yes. It's not how it works. There are moments, there are hours, there are weeks, there are months, there are yes. years. And I think that the, um, the, the way that you're probably supposed to live anyways is seasonally. Yes. Most likely, you're supposed to have a certain phase yeah. in a caloric surplus and a certain phase yeah. in a deficit. That's the way agriculture, winter, hunting, winter, farming, that's, that's the way the life way world works. works. The world yeah. works, yeah. yes. We, have, we live on Earth. Yeah. We have evolved on Earth. Therefore, we have winter and summer. So it's not about perpetually gaining weight or yes. perpetually losing weight exactly. or always staying the same. Or, exactly. It's, it's, it, there is going to be some of both. And I, I, think, yes. that, I think that's important to uh, delineate. But the key is to understand what is the price coming with yeah. what is a price coming with deficit versus surplus surplus tells you cognitive functions go down yeah right well here's a here's an example right here um was uh, in advanced ages uh advanced ages uh 67 years or older uh performed worse on executive function obese people performed worse on executive function and had smaller gray matter volume in several brain areas such as orbit, orbital frontal cortex inferior frontal Whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't need to go there. Additionally, gray matter volume predicted performance in executive function, memory, and visual yeah. motor speed. Yeah, when it's big. Yeah. yeah. So although a relationship has been established between cognitive performance and structural differences in the obese brain, the relationship between resting state, connectivity, and obesity, and cognitive function has yet to be. Yeah, so this is a very important part, though, because what they're talking about is the blood flow to the brain. Yep. When the gray mat matter starts to shrink like that, it's a problem of blood flow to the brain and a number of things like this. It's a very, very important uh, part that they're mentioning. A lot of the time when we talk about obese people and let's all cheer for obese people, we're talking about 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice? Yeah. Yeah, because they're not paying the price for it mm -hmm. yet, right? Because they are young enough that they can do it until COVID-19 shows up and yeah. starts killing them. But when you start to look at obesity amongst 50, 60, like the, the, the price to pay, is absurd and many times i feel like we just refuse to look at people over 40. Mm -hmm. you know i mean in whenever we yeah. do studies and everything it's like try to be overweight over 40. see how your body yeah. responds and again the cognitive functions and all that stuff the gray matter stuff matters a lot because it was shown that there's a relationship between an elevated bmi and the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex prefrontal cortex is the seat by the way of the me sense of self cognition capacity, socialization, they, they just, you, you don't mess with the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And there's a direct link between elevated BMI and the lack of blood flow to that part of the brain. That alone should tell you, guys, yeah. like you can't do it, as you, you just said, which was a very good point, you cannot do it forever. No. Over time. Yeah. Like it's just, it's a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about this on the protocol, like to go into calorie surplus versus calorie deficit. The reason I don't talk about it is because, first of all, if I say calorie surplus, people will just eat more, men, eat more. Yeah, because now there's basically a problem with men trying to get too big yeah. because of bodybuilding and everything. And so if I say that, people will just go up and up, feel like shit and say the protocol is not working. Women will go the other way, starve themselves, feel like shit and say it's not working because people are so narrowed down to a mentality of the only thing that exists is today and I have to be tomorrow I have to be exactly like today yeah, or yeah. even slightly better but only one way yeah. that it's it's an it's an unsustainable system and if I start to say calorie surplus versus deficit we're going to go straight to macros which gives everybody anxiety welcome to the mm -hmm. Voltron effect which is completely unhealthy and unsustainable so that's why we're trying to teach you how to do things instead of what to do because what to do goes against the Voltron effect that is unsustainable. Yeah. On fasting here real quick too yep. is a good point here. Uh, recent study, overnight fasting, um, insular cortex showed altered functional connectivity strength in the temporal lobe network. One of the explanations put forward was that obese participants could be interpreting the state of food dep deprivation as more threatening yeah. than lean participants. Right, so you could go into the sympathetic 
uh, side on that one because, for example, we saw the putamen uh, nucleus being over uh, activated, which is the center for uh, motor skill and motor control and everything. So you, you we know, for example, that speaking of that, do you know that? Oh, I didn't link those two together. Uh, I just did it right now. There's a direct link between the gut flora, you know, I was talking about the mm -hmm. other day, and the motor control uh, part of the brain through the sympathetic innervation. Interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember? Yeah, that's, and that's the di the direct line. The direct that's line. The direct like line. literally a line that goes like this yeah. from the motor control part of the brain directly to the gut flora. And that's on the sympathetic side. So now I got to check to see if the putamen is part of that or not. But imagine how interesting that would be. Because yeah. I would show you that uh, you start to get hungry. It's literally going to make you move and everything, mm -hmm. which would explain why they have that strong reaction. They have that strong physical reaction to and, and I think there's being also hungry. on the sympathetic side with the gut flora is there's also the, yeah, uh, the carbs, the carbs yeah. uh, and then what's the pull going sugar. to be? More sugar, more carbs, and the push becomes more intense because right. it is a sympathetic side. So what if that means that... It connects you exclusively to action, exactly. exclusively for carbs, exactly. because that's what's home. So what if carbs, not addictive per se, but addictive in that sense, what if, if uh, let's put things together, what if... Again, like this is some I, I need to look We're it up. Speculating it out, but yeah, speculating this is openly. How we talk. Yeah, because I just because <laughs> I just linked it together because I don't know if the put I mean is part of the stuff I was reading about. So that's gonna require a few hours. But um, what if then there's a direct relationship between carbs, sympathetic movement? That means that carbs would make you get off your ass to go get more carbs. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would explain the also a very interesting part about carbs versus fat you cannot overeat fats yeah this is an argument that that i saw uh, on instagram was saying like well obese people overeat fats as well i'm like not if there's no carbs mm -hmm. you can always overeat carbs you cannot overeat fats by themselves yeah like you'll, you'll just puke it out mm -hmm. but if the carbs were to basically go through the sympathetic innervation go straight to your brain to make you move and want more carbs, that would explain a lot of things. Yeah. And that would explain also why athletes love carbs so much. When they say carbs is a fuel for uh, athletes, that's not true, lactate is. But what if carbs make you actually move yeah. more? Well, it will compel you to move. And some of it yeah. is that maybe you aren't compelled to. Right, but so if I were to want to train a third time this day, even though it's a bad idea mm -hmm. because my body is telling me no, I could have carbs that would make you, me move, yeah. right? Remember also that dietary fats trigger the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm which is another part of the brain, whereas carbs go directly sympathetic. So yeah. that would explain why carbs as a source of energy, why athletes are so addicted to it, because literally it would be a pill to make you move, mm -hmm. because you would bypass your brain saying, don't do it. Yeah. Because, you know, conservation versus expenditure of energy, you, you're tired, you, your basically entire parasympathetic side say, we need to rest, but you want to override that. Then if this is true what I'm talking about, then the easiest way to override it is to have carbs because then it leaks directly to the motor control, yeah. which means now I want to do stuff. That's a cheat. That's a pill. Mm -hmm. That's a fix. That wouldn't make sense. And there's a uh, pile that in with things like selfish brain theory and the you know, right and, and those types exactly. of things. And all of a sudden exactly. you have this, right. this, this loop. Self. It's just Th this that would explain loop. the selfish brain and, theory. And, that would prove even more the selfish brain theory. And, and we talk about how it's 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 caloric surplus forever is what's causing obesity yes. over the long term. Well, you have a feedback loop that incentivizes it. Uh, right. you know, this is a thing exactly. we've talked right. about in almost everything. But you have bad incentives that, means that, that you don't interrupt. Over, and it's just going over to go training, over. which is prediction winning, would lead to uh, overeating, yeah. which we see. Yeah, That's interesting. Now this gets into the... Not overtraining, but like the will to, uh, to train too much. Like more is better, basically. It will lead to calorie surplus. Yeah. Where did I find this? Striatal activity. I don't think that's the one I wanted. Investigating neural activation in a sample of adolescents at high risk for developing obesity, youth with two obese or overweight parents, and adolescents at low risk for obesity, people with two lean parents. 
Design a paradigm for assessing the response to monetary reward and food stimulus. Found participants at high risk for obesity showed higher reward responsivity than participants at low risk. Now that caught my eye just because I think what I find when you talk about addiction mm -hmm. yep. and you talk about uh, an addiction on any level, not just a drug addiction, it could be yep. cigarettes, could be sex, could be yep. anything. It, it boils down it's to never that, that, that reward system. Sex is never on addiction. <laughs> I disagree, which probably <coughs> means something, but yeah. I've met a couple. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so the the thing is, is the like the re the reward system just becomes problematic, right? And I think that, and I think that's where I, you see um, basically incentives reinforcement, incentives yep. reinforcement, but there isn't any actual gain. So I think seeing that obese people. Or even with a propensity for obesity, because mm -hmm. because I think that's patterning. Then you're seeing parents do it. There, there was twenty effect. Yeah, there's there, always there, there, yeah, there's there more than one. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, I think that just that's a really really interesting thing yeah. to see. I mean, Which culturally we know, but we're like, always hammering the reward system in this, and that's what I see a lot. Everything seems mm -hmm. to come back to, it's the it's not just that it happens; that it's a behavior that goes off. It's that there. There but, is a chemical but, thing. Yeah, that and I remember stops. this: uh, everything has as intent. So therefore, that reward system has, a, has an intent. Yeah, it's supposed right. to yeah. be there. Yeah, that's we're how not it, supposed so it's, to have fifty thousand right. calories at our disposal yeah. right now yeah. in our home. Yep, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here's a summary. Here, um, in summary. Although previous research has found that the putamen nucleus is abnormally recruited in the obese brain in the presence of visual food stimuli. We now explicitly delineate the presence of abnormal intrinsic connectivity networks between the putamen nucleus and the corticolimbic areas involved in salience detection. Yeah. Our finding provides additional support to the support to this hypothesis that obesity may be related to a failure to deactivate limbic food reward re regions when required to do so. Um, yeah, so okay, so what they're saying is we've known for a while that the the putamen nucleus is linked to uh, with ob obesity and uh, you know, like that physical almost action. Yeah. What they are saying right there is that it shows that uh, they're linking obesity and addiction, basically. Yeah. Is what they, without saying it, that's what they're saying. So there's an interesting thing too, where it said, um, it said there was activation of the putamen positively correlated with the subjective rating of appetite. Um, they said mm -hmm. it might seem logical that the results of altered connectivity within the salience network may be caused by an increase in the feeling of hunger in the obesity group. However, examination of the degree of hunger showed differences in the opposite direction. That is, participants with obesity showed a lower subjective feeling of hunger than lean participants. This results in an agreement with several studies indicating that the excess of energy intake in obesity is at least partially explained by the behavior of eating in the absence of hunger. The degree that's, a self, that's also the selfish brain theory right there. Yeah. And the degree of hunger was neither associated with connectivity yeah. in the putamen nu nucleus within the salience network, nor did it interact with the group of participants in the resting state. Okay, so w wait one second. Um, this is the, the problem is hunger. Uh, this is also the point we made many times that sometimes you think you're hungry when you're actually just bored. Yeah. When you reach for the cashews, you'll know you're not hungry. Hunger's not always about food. Right, exactly. So that's what they're talking about. When they say hunger, they mean like the true hunger. You know, when you go like, yeah. you know, like, and even, like and your stomach is growling and or even whatever. And then yeah. this whole thing is still based upon their own subjective self-rating because that's the best measurement you're going right. to get. Right, so that means that, yeah. <laughs> but it's, their so, interpretation of hunger right. at the it, maximum exactly. hunger right. is actually, this is what, what the way I kind of read this to show, it actually, they could feel most hungry but actually it's probably less. Right. It's a, so, yeah. So that means that over sensitivity. What they, because in that case, people say, uh, I'm hungry. That's not true. What they're saying is I want to eat yeah. and I want to eat and I need to eat has been shown that it has nothing to do. Uh, one has nothing to do with the other. And then uh, lean people are basically better at our, there's a smaller gap between want to eat and need to eat than with obese people. Yeah. And that's a selfish brain theory, by the way. Um, so they're sug suggesting that the gain in functional connectivity in participants with obesity underlies a cost efficiency processing of information. And that's what it comes down to. This isn't obesity makes you stupid. No. It's that there's a lot of shit that's going to get in the way of your cognition if you habituate right. this stuff. Exactly. And, um, and we could have started this with the obesity makes you fat issue. Or obesity it makes, you, makes, makes you, stupid you stupid. And it's not that. And, and, and that's a good, that's good clickbait. But 
the truth of the matter is, is that there is cognitive effects. It's slow, it's gradual, it matters, and it's in addition to all and your other health And it's effects. specific because it means that obesity leads to the salience network getting weaker and the default part of the default mode network getting, getting stronger. So and it's I a think... specialization of a brain network. That's what obesity leads to. It leads to a specific specialization of the brain network at the expense of, by the way, the right interior and cellar, which is such an important part yeah. of the brain. So, at the end of the conclusion, we speculate this, this aberrant activation pattern may be related to overeating through an imbalance between the processing of homeostasis and salience detection. In addition, there was, there was negative correlation between activation of the putamen nucleus salience network, the speed, and mental, speed of mental processing in obesity, which is consistent with the notion... That was repetitive shit. Yeah. But, but you get that. I want to point out, though, um, as a person who has been overweight, not been overweight, you know, and gone from not doing any physical activity to doing it and gone from not eating healthy to paying attention to what mm -hmm. it is. The things that you need <laughs> is you need to take action. You need the salience network. You need the executive network. You need to be yeah. out there doing yes. things like... You need <laughs> all and, networks. And, and, when, and yeah. when I reflect on what my life was before, I had made those changes. It was very much a kind of a poor me, you're just here, you can't, you know, it mm -hmm. really is. You're not, you're not seeing what, to get out of that requires pattern recognition. It requires choosing to take action based upon that pattern recognition. And I think this is just described that those things all will trend you further and further away from that stuff. Yeah. And I'll make, um, what, so when I started the, the seminars, like so, like whatever it was, five years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, I was, that's when I was at my uh, competing instrument. And then at some point, I got fat. At 250, I was just fat. Uh, I can be at 235, be reasonably lean for a strongman. Yeah. Um, anything past that, it starts to get hard. Like 240 is about as high as I can go after that. And even at 240, it was yeah. getting a bit, you know, on the chubby side. And then I just was getting fat, which is why I stopped. What I find interesting about all this is one of the reasons I said, fuck it, let's do the world tour, is because I had realized that I hadn't read a book in a year and a half, mm -hmm. which is weird to know when you know me. Uh, but literally, I was like, um, I was at a stage where I looked in mirror and did not like what I saw because I did not, I, I was not reading anymore. Mm -hmm. I had not read a book of, inter of interest for a year and a half, which has probably never happened in my life. This is also the period when I went from 230 to 250, which I find interesting. Now, I'm not saying the, the two are, ne that's, there's a causation there, but at least it's part of the story because there was mm -hmm. other stuff happening in my life and, you know, raising Yaya by myself was having so many clients, so I was tired, all that stuff. But that's also the time where I was obsessed about gaining muscle. Mm -hmm. And going from 230 to 250, I remember how I felt at 250, which was not good, yeah. fat and all that stuff. But I, I remember the anger I was starting to feel at myself for not being smart enough for my own minimums. Mm -hmm. And that, that coincided exactly at that time where the calorie surplus was real. Yeah. So there's an entire thing there that I find very, very interesting. And, and that connection, the thing that I found as I started to lose weight, eat better, train yeah. harder, go from not moving to moving. I mean, that's all a part of all of this, too, I think. They, yep. the, the physicality is removed from this in general. This is definitely, that's a big isolation, but you kind of have to to draw some of these correlations. Is that going from not moving to moving and eating too much to eating the right amount yep. and quantities uh, really, really did require, it, it required action, it required learning. And in that process, exactly. you yeah. have to get out of that default mode network and there yeah. has to be action and processing. What I do know is during those first two years or so, two or three years, is the most learning that I've done as an adult. Like, right. and, and not yeah. learning as in learning the hardest. Yeah. I mean, learning like I am seeking out information and I'm finding this and I'm learning this, like reading, studying, boom, boom, boom. Not a day, none of this had anything yeah. to do with what I did for a living. It yeah. was just, so for me, there was, a, there was just a switch that got hit at some point. Literally. Where I, literally, we talk about yep. that. And all of a sudden, I was just spending more time within these other networks in hindsight. Yeah, exactly. And, and all of a sudden, now I'm equipped to handle it. Right. And I think that's actually a very important part. And that's really what I want people to get out of this, is that that hyper-specialization of the calorie surplus is at the... Exp all hyper-specialization comes comes at a, at a price. When it comes to calorie surplus, it seems that the price is your cognitive functions, your capacity to access other brain networks. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a big one then. Yeah. If 
uh, Calorix surplus gets you stuck in a deficit mode network and a very specific part of it. That's a big one. The lack of blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. Remember, that's the 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 seat of the of the sense of me. Mm -hmm. You know I mean, of the sense of self in the mist. So that means that like that rabbit hole will go yeah. very, very far. If there's a direct relationship between calorie surplus over time, yeah. over time. And so like BMI being too elevated and the, the incapacity to switch from network to network, that leads to major dysfunctions. Yeah. And not just physically unhealthy. Then that leads to ma major cognition dysfunctions. Yeah. That, that'd be a fairly large problem it won't be inst investigated much further than this because we don't want to hear it when it becomes uh, when it starts to crash the healthcare system then maybe we'll yeah. be able to revisit it again yeah well and we haven't even gotten into there's nothing to I, I think we want to take time to process some of the um, anxiety related things oh, that we might see from this yes. that'll go on yeah, that, forever that's, that's, all another, that's, um, that's another <coughs> platform together but um yeah, what a what a what a what a really interesting study. The thing yeah. is, this is a study that's not done in any way searching for fat shaming. It's about I, I read this as finding like some underlying things that are going right. on. For example, the rabbit hole like that. Just... Well, now you know what some of those feedback loops are. And the putamen versus uh, now I want to see if the putamen nucleus through the sympathetic innervation is linked to directly to the gulf flower or not. Yeah. So I have to go pick up the other study. <coughs> but imagine if they are, then the effect of carbs. Is, goes directly into movement. Yeah. Then the biggest sympathetic fix when you're tired would be carbs. In order to train, I need carbs. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. But because either you don't want to train or you're too tired or so it would be literally a pill to it. So carbs as a pre-workout. Yeah. But that's always the, same, the problem with a pre-workout. It's like if you need a pre-workout to train, you should not have a pre-workout. Mm -hmm. If you don't need a pre-workout, you can have it. Yeah. Then you read the same thing with carbs. If you need carbs to train, then you should not have carbs. If I'm right with the uh, with the connection, which I still I still have to look into it, yeah. but that'd be a very interesting idea. Yeah. Again, it's a Voltron effect. I would tell you, like, if you need the carbs to train, you're tired. And I think I think the way that we can win this like PC war on yeah, obesity, well, yeah. like like is is I think to do it just like this is using what we'll call the Voltron effect. Mm -hmm. Every one, every system is better than the sum of its parts. I think, yes. it, I think if we approach that this thing with that, and you can present people or the whatever if you're trying to inform people about obesity, um, is it can't be pursued or misconstrued as fat shaming by a reasonable person if it comes from a place where you're caring about them as a whole. Which means exactly. we're not saying this because of how you look yeah. or anything. No, it's because, because we want, we, you, to we want you to do better, feel better, live longer, be healthier. And so that comes from a place of love, which is very different. And fat shaming is not that. So, yes. yeah, so I just, I won't yeah. have that. I, I just yes. won't participate. And like, no, if anyone feels anything my way, I don't, I will, there, you'll never hear me apologize for anything no. you say on this topic. By the way, on the comment on YouTube, someone made a very good point that Dragon Ball, uh, Dragon Ball Z has his own uh, Voltron is effect. Voltron? It's called a Potara Fusion. It doesn't ring off the tongue as well. If you know Dragon Ball, you know what I'm <laughs> Z and Super, you know what I'm talking about. The, yeah. I don't have any idea. Digito. If I'm being honest, I've never watched an episode of Dragon Ball Z. Don't tell me that. I don't want to. Whatever. Anyway, here's the so thing. So, Potara Fusion. Where I'm from, if I grew up watching that, I'd, I would be the only one, I think. There's nobody I knew my age that ever watched Everybody anime or Dragon Ball, Ball, Ball Z. Yeah, I don't know. Sounds... Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super. South Dakota, man. <laughs> Yes. Dude. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, that's yeah. That's our podcast. Yeah, that'll do it. So strongfit.com, strongfitequipment.com. We got the online classroom stuff there. That's where Julian's functional integration training template is. We can't take the mic off. Now they're gonna hear it. <laughs> that's like actively just blowing on the microphone while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> We have all our online programs. Julian's one-on-one -on -one coaching, functional integration, training template. Gyms are opening up back now, right now, right? So there are places opening in the world. Not, Gyms are not opening. Here yet. Ohio, my hometown. Uh, right. So in the U.S. they're opening, but not here in Holland. I guess, like, yeah. As as to right now, we're still saying September first for gyms. Yeah. I can't believe for a second that's yeah. sorry. I can't um, believe for a second that's going to stick. Yeah. I, there's there's a lot of good resourceful gym owners around here. By the way, the good since fight. now we're going to have our own gym. Like we are moving on in two days, this Friday, 
uh, we're going to start filming again and I'm going to post video of me training in my own gym. And if you don't like it, you can go fuck yourself <laughs> because go ahead, call the cops. Yeah, please. I just want to get your names when I like, yeah, you know what I mean, but yes, I will be training in my own gym. I will be posting those videos. I will be inside, not outside. You are welcome to call the cops. Yeah. If you live in Holland and don't like it, go fuck yourself. Yeah. We don't play that shit. Not at all. Snitches get stitches <laughs> and end up in ditches. <laughs> so, well, God, that makes for a real hard business proposition. <laughs> no, I don't like the whole like snitching stuff. Yeah, no, no, it's like it's inhumane. It's... Like the f like. So everybody is on uh, Team Captain America. Yeah. Very few people on Team Iron Man because yeah. you have to stand up for what you believe in. And yeah. And all of you fucker who snitch, what team do you think you're on? Yeah. Not even Team Iron Man. You're <laughs> fucking on the Thanos side. Uh, no, 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 like yeah. all that shit, like like the how easy people started snitching on their neighbors. It's, it's, and it's fundamentally one of the most disgusting things. It's not just right. an appeal to authority. It's selling out, over selling what? out your people over, to people who do not yes. care about you or exactly. that. Exactly. Over, over what? Like yeah. that, that whole overhyped pandemic by the, yeah. by the media who just like, do you, do you realize what all this has done to, yeah. uh, to all of you? Like, not, not all of you, but to yeah. some of you. Well, my like, thing is always this. You call the cops on me, I will hurt you worse than any pandemic will, I fucking promise. Like, right? it's insane. <laughs> like, that's, I just, like, I find, that, I find that crazy. Yeah. Like, what he has shown to some people to be. There's, like, a, there's a percentage of people that suck, man. There just really is. No, but I always wonder, like, who were the during the World War, like in France, you know, during the yeah. Resistance days when the the, the, the Germans yeah. were in Paris. You always wonder who was collaborating. Mm -hmm. Apparently, if it was today, a very large percentage yeah. of the population yeah. would just go with it, and for nothing in their personal interest. Like, yeah, just like well, I was told. Yeah, at the very yeah. least, you know, if they were going to call you and have you arrested, they'd get all your stuff. Maybe I get it. Well, but like the that really was is, after. That's yeah, once they left. Yeah. But, yeah. but I mean, now yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Like, were you getting a high five? On You're the snitching way? Like, for on your neighbors because, for what? Because they're locked because in the, the house and bored. Yeah, because the media tells you it's a good thing to yeah. do, which is what kills me. Like, the, I, it is my firm belief that the media will be the one who pays the highest price on this and will be eventually dis, dismantled over yeah. this as they should. I think the podcast are the media's number one enemy right now mm -hmm. and uh the podcasts are winning over the yeah the, the corporate media who needs to go you're seeing you're seeing you can look up uh, some of the biggest podcast numbers and it's burying major television news not even close. Burying. not even close. and we're not talking yeah. just rogan yeah. like there's a dozen podcasts that will do bigger numbers than every fucking television show yeah. Yeah. that's out there. Rogan puts up Super Bowl numbers on a weekly basis. It's fucking insane. It doesn't even yeah. make sense. But that's, but that's also, I think, what happened. Uh, we talked about this when the COVID-19 started. Yeah. And my first thing that I said was like, you have to understand that this is a dying creature, the mm -hmm. uh, corporate media, who is having a last go at money. Well, if you ever see an actual... It's a sales. If you ever hunted, yeah. right? There's, yeah. uh, there's a thing that happens when you hunt an animal. You want it to be done humanely. You'd like to... to Shoot an animal, drop it, clean, yep. kill. No suffering, no nothing, right? Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, can't always be that way. But there's also times where you do get a clean drop. Yep. The animal's immobile, but it's it's dying out yep. right there. Cloak. And and what happens, though, is when you get up to, say, a, a deer, a buck, it's a big fucking strong animal yes. that with big antlers, that what happens, one of two things will happen there when you walk up there. It will stay there. It will do nothing Wait until, until until you yep. until you do kill it. It'll or it'll just die there. But you want to make sure it's quick, or you have to be very careful. You have to get a read on it because what it may do is be there until you get close enough, and it is going to just do the last thing that it possibly can yep. do. Its last ditch effort is to just and try to and try to kill and get rid of yep. you, and then see what's yep. left after that. And I think that's what I'm seeing from the media. Yes, it's this so. just it's the death knell, and they're yeah. lashing out and trying exactly. to hang on to stir up any any commotion that can be stirred up is valuable to them. You know when you're about that's to go now, bankrupt. We're not arguing about COVID. Yeah. There's COVID stuff. There's a million things that are thrown up, and it's all divisive for the population. Yeah, is no because they don't talk about death rate anymore. Yeah. They don't even talk about how many deaths there are. They just talk about cases now yeah. because they keep going up. Yeah, but they weirdly yeah. they stop talking about how yeah. many deaths per country and stuff like that. Yeah. When was the last time you saw numbers? 
But yeah, that only cases. Look for them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. right. So you don't like when you're about to declare bankruptcy and you sell all the shit to your friends for cash so that yeah. you can stick it to the bank. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, while while racking up the last year debt. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, because the bank is gonna get is gonna get it. But yeah. like you know. So by the way, bankruptcy always owe the bank and taxes never people. Yeah. Because if you're gonna owe someone. Yeah. It's going off taxes anyway. Yeah. So uh, to me, that's what, that's what uh, yeah, it's a death knell of the media. Yeah. And let's be honest, the medical world did not prove to be, I talked about this right away, where I was like, be careful. The medical world has become the new priesthood. Mm -hmm. And you are, give, you are being given power. Be careful what you do with it. Yeah. So now, what did we see? And I'm sorry, but I talked about this three months ago from the beginning. Like, we're going to save the healthcare system. We are bankrupting hospitals. Mm -hmm. How's that working? Yeah. Yeah, bankrupting Sorry. them by not allowing any of the actual procedures to go on that make them money. Right. They're and, furloughing doctors and nurses. And we everywhere. will not talk about how many suicide cases there is. No one wants to talk about that. People that are not getting screened for cancer, that, mm -hmm. the, that dude, you know, that English dude was saying it's probably going to up, up yeah. to 50,000 people dying because of that in England alone. Yeah. Like, it goes on and on and on and on. I, three months ago, I said, be careful, medical world. You were given the power to change the world. Be careful what you do with it. Yeah. It's a new priesthood. I'm just, I'm sorry, I was right. Yeah. And you know and who else has the power to change the world? You guys out there. By going through by subscribe podcast. by hitting subscribe. I, and there's a time window in which I can do that now. But by the way, that used to be a thing. I used to be able to put those buttons up anywhere at any time. I think yep. in 2007, 18, they started phasing it out, oh. and now you only get the last 15 seconds of the video. Oh yeah, like that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. It's tricky. Yeah. But uh, anyway, podcast on strongfit.com is where you can support the podcast. We've got the current setup where one-time donations there, or you can tap to join the. Uh, if you want a subscription option, you're better off. Go still to that site, but there's a subscribe to our channel uh, because then for nine bucks or fifteen bucks you can subscribe and actually get some premium content for your subscription as opposed to. And we're just gonna do a, a live Q and A for all of you because we said we do it for a hundred and, and we, we are one hundred and thirty. Now I said a thousand. I said a thousand, but not yes. by thinking what that meant. Yeah, and that would be an amount of money with which uh, you know I won't even talk about what I'll do. If we yeah, get to exactly. that. <laughs> but the fact is we are at 140 right now, so so which was very fast. Yeah, yeah. And so we will do a live Q and A for you guys. Yeah, and the thing is, I like it a lot. That's one of I, like it's a uh, actually getting the episodes up published early in there. The dialogue that comes in yeah, from the week cool, or two before yeah, no, they get out there. Yeah, this is exactly what I hoped it's, it would it's be. It's like oh good. Yeah, you know exactly like, what I hope it would be. Yeah. yeah, and I find more and more and more that like that those people, the people in the range of paying and wanting like like kind of reaching out and trying to put your stuff in front of anybody other than those people yeah. can be just really counterproductive. Yeah. So we do our thing from a mountain, but we're going to give stuff to the people who choose yeah, to support Yeah, and again, us. you don't feel supported. You don't feel Yeah. You don't feel the well, love. It doesn't matter. There's I nothing mean, to it. There's yeah. too many people yeah. in the world for you to yeah. try to make every make put something out in front of everybody. Yeah. So uh, but it's this been really cool. It's been one yeah. of my favorite things. Yeah. I think the assessment videos are super valuable and there will be lots Plus, of... Plus, by the way, this is how it works because that way all of you are paying for the gym, paying the rent of the gym right now, yeah. almost close to. And that Which means... Which is where we're going to start creating and how we're going to create exactly. all the content to put in. And then, so now we can start, now that we'll have our gym with that, we can start uh, filming all of our training videos and yep. put them for you guys to see how, how we train. Yeah. And so it works great like yeah. this. Yeah, it's, from, it's a good from, way. from overall instructionals to just live stream and training sessions yep. to all sorts of shit. Um, we have a lot of good opportunities now having that going forward. So check it out. You can also just subscribe to there by going to youtube.com forward slash strong fit. Everything else you can find, strongfitequipment.com.au, Manta Fitness, Sandbags in Australia and New Zealand, and Julian Strongfit1 on Instagram, and I am Tyler F. And Stone on Instagram, Richard's Rare Barracuda, Protocol Cooking Show as well on YouTube. So, all right, see you in a couple days.